Hi, everyone. I'm Brianne Kimmel, founder of WorkLife, an early stage venture fund building a better work life through new tools, services, and ways for people to make money. At WorkLife, we invest at the intersection of consumer culture and work. We partner with the world's most innovative brands, and we build tools and strategies that bring great ideas to life. Today, I'm excited to have Jenny, the co-founder of ReInc, with Megan Rapino and the US women's soccer team, and Jess, the visionary creative director behind the brand built to challenge the status quo. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So today's conversation will span ReInc's inception, the development of its distinct brand, leadership lessons learned on building a business with the same speed and intensity as a sports team, and then one of my favorite topics, how do we challenge, how do we channel influence and drive action in periods of uncertainty? So looking at how the US women's soccer team has really been a strong voice around macro discussions for the US economy and bringing a real voice to individuals, especially underrepresented individuals globally. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm excited to have you both here and hope this is a really um, thoughtful discussion. Feel free to you know, share any insights. I know that you yourselves are building an early stage startup. And so I think it's a really great time to have a conversation for other early stage founders that are just starting to think through brand building and what that looks like. So um, one of the first questions and just to kick things off, um, I would love to um, really spend some time on how you thought through um, the meaning behind reimagine the status quo and sort of how um, both of you define what does it mean uh, to challenge the status quo and how you're doing that from a brand standpoint? Sure. So maybe it would be helpful if I first um, gave an overview of how the company got started and then Jess can really dive into the branding because she's the creative genius. If that, if that sounds good? That sounds great. Yeah. So, I mean, the company was really first, I guess, imagined in 2015 when the team first won the World Cup. Uh, and, you know, at that time, they were frustrated that everyone from U.S. soccer to Nike to FIFA was all making money off of them except for themselves. And as you've probably read in the news, I mean, it's unfair for them for most years that are not championship years to have to do endorsements for brands that maybe they're not as excited about or do like other types of roles in order to try to make a living when they're being compensated so unfairly. So after they won in 2019, a lot of things had changed in that four year period. When you think about, you know, Me Too has happened, Time's Up has happened, people are finally starting to talk about what does pay equity look like and where are there gaps in that? And so Reink was really founded with the mission and the vision that, you know, instead of trying to fight for a greater slice of the pie, why don't we just create a brand new pie by ourselves? And the best way to create your own pie is through, as you are, I'm sure, are very well aware of, is through creating startups. When you found a startup, you own the equity, you call the shots, you get 100% of the revenue that comes your way, and you control basically your destiny, and you're able to have unbounded upside with the type of financial return that you're able to get. And so we originally created the name Reink because it invokes a lot of the rewords that really inspire who we are from resisting the status quo to reimagining what the future could look like to redefining different industries and norms, um, et cetera. And since then, it's just been an amazing journey so far. We've scaled the team quickly. We've dropped a bunch of products. It's a woman-run, woman-owned, woman-founded team. The majority of stakeholders on the cap table are women. We raise money from an, inc and from an incredible female investor from Kleiner Perkins, um, who is Annie Case. And a big part of this was also creating a brand that really was able to reach to this community that felt like their voices was were not being heard or that there wasn't necessarily a brand out there for them and you know kind of by them even and so that's also where Jess's work comes in and I'm sure she'll tell you more about that and we're um, also both co-founders of the company and Jess is the chief brands and creative officer chief brands and experience officer so all things brands and marketing Awesome. Jess, I'm so excited to have you too, because I feel like from a brand standpoint, um, it's been really awesome to see just how rich a lot of the topics are that you're driving. I mean, everything around, um, you know, talking through the LGBTQ community, 
really thinking through like to what extent are we empowering you know women to rethink and reimagine some of those stereotypes in a really empowering way so i'd love to talk a little bit about like the decision to build a company rather and, and building its own separate independent brand but also relying on megan and the other teammates who can sort of amplify your creative direction and, and the way that you want to drive certain um topics and especially like some politically related topics forward yeah um well before i get started just like a realness update i'm a mom of two kids and working from home so there might be a toddler that busted this door and there might be a screaming baby i have to go get so um so working mom just uh but that's very i mean it's what everybody's living right now so just so you know um <laughs> also called work so, we're totally cool with kids breaking into the door awesome <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, when, when I came on, so I was, a I came on as a consultant and as an advisor. So, um, my background is I've worked with mostly fortune 100 or sort of entrepreneurs, um, in helping them create a new brand, a new business and sort of like create massive impact in the world. So that's my background. So when this opportunity came my way, what was so clear right away is that this was a group of four women that had to resist, 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 resist. And they were, as Jenny said, were tired of the sort of trope of having to resist the status quo and actually wanted to create something new within it. Um, and so that is so much of our brand is about like, okay, enough of, enough of, enough of resisting. When you resist something, you're giving power to that reality that you don't want to exist. So now this is the moment for us all to step into a new reality that we are creating. Um, and I think what's also so important about the brand is it's not about being alternative. So it's not like an alternative to the norms. It's actually just a totally new normal. Um, and that has deeply resonated with our community who's saying like, I'm not looking like to go be a rebel. I actually want to continue to live my life. Um, I just want to do it in a way that's true to me. So the way that, I mean, all four of the players that are founders of the team live their lives, it's so um, connected to what we're trying to do with Re-Inc. Um, you know, obviously, especially Megan Rapino um, is just very, very vocal on issues that matter to her most. Um, and so when we were thinking about navigating the brand and how much do we want to go into issues that really matter, um, it's definitely a fine line. Like we see ourselves as being a company that is for movement makers and tastemakers. So if you just like want these awesome clothes that like just look super dope and just make you feel good, you can wear them. Um, if you want something that actually represents more than that and is driven by purpose um, and has like a deep perspective, therefore you too. Um, and what we're finding is so many, so many members of our community are kind of at this like um, this intersection point between like caring and cool. So like Pino always says that she wants to make caring cool and like caring is becoming sort of what cool used to be. Um, and I think that's like where so much of our brand is, is like, we really want to be there for you um, to like feel great about how you, how you look and how you show up every day. But then also we want to create this sort of utility in your life um, and inspiration to make you feel stronger. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. It's been awesome to see the evolution of the brand as well. And I think in so many ways, it really embodies a lot of the same thoughts and, you know, feelings and reasons why I built work life. And so I remember when Reing was first launched, um, there was a great piece, I think it was in Fortune that had said, you know, you have these soccer stars that wanted to build a company that's aligned with their values. And so I think there is this real interesting intersection where it's like, in a lot of ways, you know, the companies that work life has invested in and the even just the companies that come to us naturally are ones that have that sort of value alignment. And so I'm seeing this shift where it's like, you know, at work life, we talk a lot about 
operating at the intersection of consumer culture and work. And I think if anything, like we're seeing this today where it's like we might at any at any point in time have a toddler break into the room or, you know, all these things where it's like work and life are really starting to converge and becoming one and the same. How have you thought about, I mean, with high profile and vocal and incredibly busy um, co-founders, how do you think about balancing company building, you know, angel investing, brand sponsorships, like what does the day to day look like and how has that really been used to elevate the platform? I think from my perspective, like there's, there's kind of this old belief. It's another belief that we're kind of showing is outdated is that if you, to be successful, you can only do one thing. Like you can only be an athlete or you can only be this or you can only be that. And what our brand is really showing is that actually, if you are truly great, you can be a Renaissance person and do all of these things. So our uh, CEO, Kristen Press, she's having, or before um, the games got canceled moving forward um, because of coronavirus, she was having the absolute um, highlight of her career. Like she is outperforming on the field and doing better than ever. And almost every day uh, before she goes into the field, she's slacking with me until the very last minute. Um, and like, we're working out the final details. And that's just like, I was in labor with my baby that I just had and I was like, slacking with Jenny and then I was like, I have to go. And I had the baby three hours later. So she I did. That was, like, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I think we're just this company of people. And then like Jenny is like co-founder in all of these different companies, advisor to all of these different companies. Like it's just like constantly like going out, doing all these different activities. Um, our company, like we have these incredible coordinators that if anybody was to look at the work that they're doing, they would think, oh, these are full-time employees they're all still in college. Um, so I think our company is just run on people that want to do great and want to do more. I love that. I wanted to, um, I think just switching gears a little bit, I'd love to talk a little about a bit about the like core mechanics of building a brand. And because I think what's really interesting is I think for a lot of early stage startups, especially technology startups, we oftentimes uh, deprioritize brand and community building and assume that's something that comes later. Like, later funding rounds, it, there's this sort of notion that, you know, the founder is the face of the brand until like a very, like a later point in time. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about um, how you think about um, company values, brand values, like what were some of the early working sessions and how did you land on the brand where it is today? Yeah, it's a just question. So right off the bat, when we were thinking about, I mean, the interesting thing about this company is it is a brand. It's not a product. Like I think so many new startups have this like incredible idea to fill a, a product white space. And our big idea was actually a community idea and realizing that there was, I mean, a brand is really just a feeling or emotion um, and the impact it has on you. And so what we realized is, there was this sort of feeling or emotional opportunity versus a product opportunity. So we started from a place of brand and business before we even figured out what the product was, which meant we were from the very beginning um, writing what our purpose statement was and what our values were. And that was just like this incredible process. It was so like, I don't, do you remember those sessions, Jenny? They were so much fun. It was um, and, like we were all on Zoom and virtual whiteboarding. We're going to go back to that later. We have a whole set <laughs> on remote tools. Because I think what's amazing is just seeing, like, to the extent that you can have such a strong brand, such a distributed and very busy team, like, there's just so many good things that really show, like, I think Reink is such a good example of what the future of work will look like because you have this missions and values alignment, you have people that are incredibly busy and balancing a lot. And it's just been so impressive to see how you've been able to do that so well. Um, are there certain, so, so switching gears a, a little bit, um, in terms of thinking through like moving from lessons from the field and from being an athlete, has a lot of that translated well into the, in the core components of the business? 
like to what extent is the speed and intensity and your ability to deliver um, really tied to the, the just the general personality and the and the skill set of your co-founders? I have a quick answer to that, which is so I'm I'm not really a sports person. I didn't really watch soccer before that much before starting this company. But now I realize that there is a particular mentality to forwards. So all so three of our four founders, they're all forwards. Mm. And to be a forward, I've come to realize <laughs> they're gonna laugh at me if they ever see this. But it's all about precision um, and incredible um, gut instincts and being able to trust those. And because your precision and your gut instinct is so good, you always get goals, you know? Um, and well, you don't always get goals, but you're, you're a winner. Like if you, if you are the best soccer player in the world and you're a forward, like your sense of precision and instinct is probably better than any of the rest of us. And so that is something I've really, really realized is like, I'm used to like, um, taking a long time to make decisions and looking at all of the different options and evaluating, but they just know, they just know right away. And so I think because of that, um, all of like my instincts have gotten a lot stronger and and I've like learned to like trust them again, because I think we all, we all have that ability. We just kind of lose it over the time. So we are like, we're so good about like, looking at insights, of course, and looking at data, um, but then like very quickly being able to make a quick decision. Um, so that's, that is the aspect of sports that's translated to business. Yeah, and to add very, that was beautiful. And to add very quickly on that, one thing I always really admire from them is like how much discipline they have. And it really shows like, what are the characteristics of somebody who is able to make it all the way to become an Olympian? And it's just always so inspiring to see the the discipline, the self-discipline, the perseverance, et cetera. And as Jess said, the forward mentality is also very much an attacker one, but also like a try and fail fast one, which I think Rink has, we've been able to iterate very quickly to like try and test out new things that like we haven't shied away from, you know, new maneuvers or like maybe new ways of connecting with people. So I think that's been really exciting and special. I love that. And I think that actually, I mean, especially now that we're starting to see some changes even in the macro environment, I think there's so much there for early stage founders where it's like getting very clear on the goal, getting very clear on your metrics. I think right now I'm noticing a very distinct shift where, you know, I would say for the last five years, it's been fairly easy for startups to raise venture capital. And so now one of the interesting things is I think in a lot of ways, it's very similar to sports where it's now about getting back to the core fundamentals and like getting back to like, what is the goal? What is the end goal? What is the ideal state? And like, how do we work backwards and really like train accordingly? And so I've noticed that specifically where I think there's just so much goodness to what you're building because you have um, individuals who have trained their entire lives to be world class at this one thing. And so I see a lot of similarities with other types of um, entrepreneurs as well, where it's like applying that same sort of level of like thoughtfulness and practice and like a lot of these things that you can learn from other people. But if anything, it's just like putting in the time and putting in the, the thoughtful hours against it. So yeah, yeah. I think such good advice. Something else I would add to that, because um, I think those are all so true, is um, if you have been an athlete your entire life, you're used to being coached constantly, and you're really, really open to like feedback and coaching. And that's something I've really learned from our founders is like, um, so often I think in the workplace and like a traditional workplace, we're taught to kind of protect ourselves from coaching or feedback and say like, hey, I'd love some feedback, but um, also not that's not always true and something in that i've just really really loved is our company is so open to coaching and feedback um and is so allows ourselves to be very vulnerable in that way um and know that like we all have each other's best intentions so there is that like sort of like team mentality and that like captain and coaching mentality that i think really comes through as well i love that so much are there ways 
Are there ways that you're doing that remotely? Because I know because everyone is fairly distributed and individuals mm -hmm. have brand partnerships and some are angel investing and there's just like so much that's going on behind the scenes. How do you, are there, are there ways or styles that you end up giving really direct feedback or what are some of those, what are some of those processes look like? You know, I think it's, it's interesting. It's like, it's just how our culture is naturally developing. So we haven't really had to put in place a lot of like tools or tactics, although we did, we do um, monthly ret retrospectives. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's pretty common, but it's more like after anything, like we will reach out to each other and say like, how did you go? How did that go? What, what do you think I should do better next time? Um, Kristen and I constantly in our one-on-ones, we're like always asking each other, like, well, what do you think of, how, how did that go? Like, what was your experience of that? What advice would you give for me? Or looking forward to something that we're planning, we almost plan out like the game plan, you know, um, as much as everything I think is very like, um, based on instincts, we're also like super tactical and like constantly planning out the game plan. Um, but we're like testing each other as we go of like, well, you know, what do you think about this? Or I'm about to have this conversation. How do you think I should handle it? Or how did that conversation go? So it's very much more in just how we approach each other. That's awesome. And where is everyone based? Just to give a little bit more context, because I know I've said the team's distributed and you're using different tools and like having different conversations. Do you know where everyone is right now or everyone's quite like moving around a little bit depending on whether it's like on in season or off season? Uh, we're, we're everywhere. When it's in season, it's a bit crazy because the players, the player founders are always flying around to different games, but we have people in New York and Boston and LA and SF and North Carolina and every, Portland and everywhere in between. <laughs> Got it. It'd be interesting. I'd love to switch gears and talk a little bit more about remote and specifically lately now that everyone's been working from home. And, you know, I think I think Megan especially has done such an incredible job. I saw that she recently had a conversation with AOC and she's just really like dry, like incredibly innovative and also just really driving a lot of conversations that matter. I think especially around the U.S. economy, around the stimulus package. How are you thinking about like to what extent is the re brand leveraging some of those broader conversations and you know to what extent are you staying pretty like connected to each player even during this period of uncertainty? I actually feel like we're more connected than ever. Um, so we we've always been remote. So we've always had to use Slack and Zoom um, and you know Google and you know all of those types of things that I think a lot of companies right now are just getting used to. Yeah. So everything that's happened from a work perspective, we've known how to handle it and that hasn't felt overwhelming. Um, the positive thing for us is we're all finally grounded. Um, and so we actually have more time for each other, um, which has been a real positive experience. And then in terms of um, pivoting and thinking through, okay, well, this moment is what it is. How can we continue to build our community and serve our community um, and uh, and connect with our community? Um, something that we have done is these live gatherings called Reset the Table. Cool. And we gather these just like phenomenal people. We, say, we always say it's like odd bedfellows and kindred spirits um, from across different industries. We gather them around the table for brunch. And we have these like incredible little conversation cards that are actually going to be coming out soon. We're very excited about that um, in May um, that anybody can use in their home. Um, and so we use those to guide the conversation. So when all of this happened and all of a sudden Pino is at home, we just realized like there was this huge opportunity to bring that conversation even closer to our community through Instagram Live. So we started doing these reset the table conversations on live. Um, and that, and, you know, Pino is hosting them and they've been going really great. So overall, I mean, I think, I think in moments like this, of course, there's going to be, um, paralysis from just from a business perspective, you're going to feel a sense of paralysis, um, from a personal perspective, it's emotionally really difficult, but I think as leaders, 
our responsibility is to drive forward um, and not drive forward to make sales or anything like that, but to drive forward to give people inspiration and to help people um, get through this moment. Um, so that's really what we've been trying to do is just like continue to spark creativity um, regardless of where we are in the world. That's awesome. Have you thought about to what extent our individual players are collectively a, as reink? Are you getting more involved in philanthropic efforts? Like are you, are you all no. lining around a specific charity or nonprofit or is each person independently doing other things to really like help help their local community in addition to some of the broader stuff that you're working on? Yeah, so we're doing some really cool stuff. So <clears throat> we have always been committed to um, progress and art. So that is fundamental to our purpose. And we believe to create progress, you also need art and creativity as inspiration. Um, so we, uh, we do these art auctions with every collection that comes out. Um, so we just finished our second art auction and it went incredibly well. It's a piece uh, by Tobin Heath, who's one of our co-founders. Um, originally, we're going to give 17% of the proceeds from the auction to uh, a charity that, uh, not a charity, an incredible organization called um, Alternate Roots that's based uh, in the South. And they create art grants for um, sort of outsider artists or artists that are sort of um, forgotten by their communities. When everything started to happen, we realized that we really wanted to give more money. So we're giving, we ended up giving another 17% to the National um, Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh, so in that way, we felt like, okay, we're giving this art donation um, to this organization that matters regardless. You know, the world still needs art and these artists probably more than ever need access to their craft. So we felt great about that. Um, but then also we wanted to make sure that we were protecting the rights of domestic workers um, and making progress there. Um, so that's how we thought about that. And then we also, when all of this happened, we had a conversation and realized we wanted to do something that wasn't related to our products at all. Um, so we gave um, $10,000, um, which was, you know, a, a small donation, but from our perspective as like kind of a tiny little startup, it was, it was actually, um, it was, it was what we could give and, and feel really good about um, to an organization in LA called Inner City Arts. Mm -hmm. They had this plea saying, you know, we are this incredible community center for youth in LA to find an outlet to express themselves now we have to figure out how we do that offline um, uh, or online, I guess. So we we gave them the donation because we believed that art was still crucial um, and access to art and creativity was still crucial. And for this next generation to pioneer the way forward, they needed not only access to food and all the essentials, but also access to art. And then um, we actually have a capsule that's coming out really soon. We're very excited. It's it's perfect for working from home. Yay! Um, will be perfect when we all go out into the real world again, too. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's really exciting. And uh, we're going to be giving a percentage of the proceeds from that capsule um, to another organization that will provide immediate relief for COVID. So we we think about it in all that we do. And I mean, I think also just as founders, it's, it's an incredible group of people that um, really believe in paying it forward. And, and um, the other thing I'd say is we're so careful with all the partners that we work with. So we created this company to create a new pie um, and we feel very strongly in equity in distributing that pie. So um, as Jenny said, like we're female run, mostly female run, um, mostly female founded company. And then when we look at like photographers, you know, we want to make sure that the crews that we're working with um, are representational of the future that we're trying to create. So I think, you know, not just from a giving perspective, but also from um, a commerce and 
profit profit perspective, we're also really thinking about that. Yeah, I love that. That resonates so much. I mean, now that uh, work life is less than a year old, and so part of the whole model was essentially re reimagining venture and also thinking through like now that it's my own fund and it's very values aligned, also being very selective with the individuals or entities that invest in the fund. And so in a lot of ways, it was starting with great people like the CEO of Zoom, um, Ariana Huffington, Sophia Amaru. So like great names that you would love on your quote unquote cap table. Yeah. But then there's a second level of like, to what extent can we have meaningful impact and, you know, have a no minimum check size to invest for women who would love to be a limited partner in a VC fund or who would love more exposure to early stage startups. And so I really love that model of like really looking at the re -ink community that you've built and finding ways to, to also add value in other ways beyond just like, in my case, it's it's early, you know, early stage startups. In your case, it's like more than just selling a t-shirt and it's more about empowering local artists and like really bringing the right people together around the table. So thank you. It's, it, it's, it's really inspiring and it's great to see like this model can work in venture. It can work in, um, you know, in e-commerce. Like I think having this sort of values in this model is definitely the way forward. Well, it was so great to have you. Um, I would like to close on maybe a controversial question. I always like to ask something that just, you know, leaves the audience with something, something unique and insightful. Um, so one question that I have is just looking at, um, you know, how you've thought about building a distinctive brand, how you've built something that's really culturally relevant. Um, at WorkLife, we invest at the intersection of consumer culture and work. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on um, if you could change one thing about the workplace or if you could change one thing about the way that people work, um, what would that one thing be? Should we both give our takes on this? Yeah, please do. Something that I've learned from Jess that I absolutely love and that I wish could be incorporated in more workplaces is that whenever we have a big gathering with Rink, whether it's one of our reset the table events or if it's just like a team all hands or get together, a lot of times we love to start with meditation, which is not something that I'd ever had experience in before and Jess actually leads them. And I think that it really just sets the tone and um, also puts you in a place of thinking about, you know, the company, the team, the mission, and not just about like what you're here at this meeting to say, or like what your agenda items are for this particular gathering. And just really ties it back to whatever the central thesis and purpose of Reink really is. I love that. I also wonder to what extent it does feel like that could also help with group accountability as well. Because I've noticed that there's a really strong sense of like shared responsibility and ownership and the ability to have some of those really hard conversations, I think oftentimes does come back to uh, separating yourself from your work and making it feel like it's a safe space. So like setting the tone with meditation to create a safe space to have even more challenging conversations. Yeah, so much of the goal. I, I have like this crazy little i always feel like there's these little like tiny um changes that could actually have a catalyst effect so the temperature of offices was set um in the 1950s when uh men led the office and what when offices were mostly men um and uh and wore suits and somehow that has completely changed um, and yet the temperature still re remains like 65 degrees, um, which is like such a horrible, uh, has a, such a horrible carbon effect too. You, you know, if you think about like ACs and everything. Um, so I feel like there's like these little tiny things in an office that if you change them, so I guess two things that come to mind, one is the temperature and the other is um, access to um, to things you need for your period. So like access to tampons. Like when I walk into an office and like 
they have tampons in the bathroom, I always think like, okay, like they know what's up. Women work here. Or, um, or as a mom, you know, um, going to the wing, the wing has like this incredible mothering room and you, it's the most welcoming thing that people that you can't really see. So I think like, it's like, it's almost like these little tiny um, environmental changes that would have a massive impact in the right direction. Yeah, I completely agree. It's been interesting to hear just with more people working from home that the the sentiment from women as opposed to the sentiment coming from men, where it's like for women having the ability to be closer to our kids or be closer to our family, having the ability to set our own temperature and work from a, a safe space that you know we've designed specifically um, for comfort. I think it's been really interesting just to see to what extent will companies be able to uh, tell us that we have to work in an HQ once this is all over and like to what right. extent will especially women in the workplace put a stake in the ground and say we want to work from home we want to work from home x number of days per week or just really start to reimagine like what that can look like because I think to your point we've all been in those offices where there aren't any tampons where there's not a mother's room I was recently in an office where no mother's room whatsoever. And just thinking through like these new places that have been built specifically for women like the wing are really going to reimagine the workplace and make it much more inclusive. I think if not, people will choose to work from home. So they either have to have an inclusive environment and it has to be built for us or the alternative is just, just to work from home, which now we're getting more comfortable with that as well. Yeah. And that's so cool. You know, like I love Jenny, something that um, Jenny has said from the beginning of like when all this started to happen is like, Oh, it's gonna be really interesting to see like what type of startups emerge from this moment or you know like what type of innovation emerges and i think there's like so many positive social opportunities that will come out of this that really reimagine the way in which we think about work and life and everything yeah absolutely well Considering that uh, I have an early stage fund focused on work, um, I would love to share any new companies and interesting things in this space. Because I'm i already seeing, I mean, we're only a couple weeks in, but just seeing some really interesting concepts and reimagination of work and whether it's productivity tools, but also just seeing some really great services too, where it's like, I'm actually very optimistic and think we'll see, um, you know, the neighborhood make a comeback where it's like, if you're working from home and you can look, you can live anywhere that you want. I think that individuals will, you know, step out for coffee every morning. They'll start supporting local businesses um, once they're back up and running again. And so if anything, I think this is kind of the, the calm before the storm. And I think right now everyone's working from home, but I think once things get a little bit better, I can imagine people really supporting their community, you know, stepping up and getting more involved in their local art scene. And so I'm really optimistic for where things are going. Likewise. Yes, likewise. <laughs> it was so great to have you both. Thanks so much for joining. And uh, yeah, it was aw awesome discussion. Um, we will be sharing basically a playbook for, for building a brand and building a differentiated brand. Um, and this will be shared with early stage founders. And so um, it was so great to have you. And thanks so much for having the, the conversation ahead of the uh, blog post. Thank you so much. It was great. This was awesome. Yeah, thank big you. fan of your blog. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so we'll talk to you soon.